us for Hyla's um, October lunchtime CLE. We are joined today uh, by Caitlin McClellan and uh, Juan Velasquez, both from Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, and their topic is M&A basics for non-corporate attorneys. Uh, we will have CLE credit available for viewing this program live. Um, we'll put the, uh, the CLE code in the chat box um, and feel free to um, use the buttons to ask uh, questions. Um, and hopefully there will be some time to address those right at the end. Um, but I will hand it over to um, Caitlin and Juan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Harriet. Uh, so like Harriet mentioned, I'm Caitlin. Um, uh, our goal for you today with this presentation is um, for you guys to get some background on uh, what's going on with the general M&A transaction and what your role as a specialist would be in supporting any M&A transactions. Uh, and just a little bit more about myself. This is my husband, Peter, and my little girl, Ellie, who is much bigger now than she was in that photo. Um, but I'm a senior associate here at Norton Rose Fulbright. My practice is primarily private M&A um, and uh, sort of mid-sized private M&A transactions is really my sweet spot. Uh, I'm Juan Velasquez. I am also an associate here at Norton Rose Fulbright. Um, Apologies for any sore throat kind of stuff, uh, dealing with some after effects. Um, I am wrapping up my third year and my practice primarily focuses on private M&A and uh, securities uh, as well as capital markets. And Juan and I have worked together since you joined the firm, I it's, think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Caitlin was my mentor when I joined the firm, and uh, it's been a good ride. <laughs> well, you have to say that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sitting right next to you, yes. so other responses not allowed. No. Um, but no, we do work closely together, um, and Juan has supported me on many a transaction in the past, and hopefully we'll continue to work together for many more years. Uh, so we've put together just sort of what we really hope you're able to take away from this presentation. Uh, we're going to talk through the general deal life cycle, life cycle uh, what due diligence is, why it's important, and what your role as a subject matter expert, what we'll refer to as an SME throughout this presentation, what's your role as an SME in, uh, in due diligence, in the drafting of the purchase agreement, in the negotiation process. And we hope to give you some practical tips of what that actually looks like, some, some practical issues that are common that you might run into, um, you know, how you deal with reports, things of that nature. Um, and then again, just getting you familiar with general terminology as well. So <clears throat> I want to just set the table and kind of go through the general life cycle of a deal um, to introduce you to what, what the M&A team is going through and where uh, subject matter specialists or experts will, will kind of pitch in and add, add value. Um, most M&A deals follow this uh, graphic timeline, although there can be some differences. And the main difference being that there might be a waiting period or an interim period um, between the signing and the closing of a transaction. Um, usually interim period will allow for regulatory filings, um, consents to be acquired, um, and any other closing conditions that are identified during the due diligence process. Um, so once the parties say, hey, we're going to do a deal, those are the initial discussions. They're going to sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, or uh, an LOI, a letter of intent, um, which lay out the basic terms of, of the transaction. So the material um, big ticket items like purchase price, anything that any issues that they know about ahead of time that they've already been discussing, um, and they've got an idea of how to treat those, and that'll inform drafting and also the due diligence process. Once that and, uh, NDA or LOI is signed or combined a document with both, um, you're going to get the kickoff email from the M&A team saying, hey, specialist team, here is uh, this transaction, here are the parties, here's our role in that transaction, and here's what we need from you. Here's where the VDR is, here's the type of report that you need, and we're basically going to take that email and expand on it in this presentation. 
Um, from that email, you're going to start your due diligence process. Due diligence is a legal and financial review, as you know, um, and we're going to focus on the legal side of it and specifically what what, what specialist points need to need to be undertaken in that legal review. Um, that due diligence process will then inform the drafting of the purchase agreement, any ancillary documents, the disclosure schedules, and, and, and specifically any terms or conditions that, that need to be addressed coming out of the due diligence findings. Um, they'll also inform the no ongoing negotiation, so whether purchase price needs to be adjusted, um, whether there needs to be any other kind of, of, um, of strategy taken to address any uh, due diligence items. And then as we get into the signing and closing period, what filings or what, um, what actions are desirable or even necessary to be taken by the buyer or by the seller in order to get to a smooth post-closing integration side. Um, so those are all items that the specialist, you're, as a specialist, you're going to be um, have, have focused in on your area of that, of that target during the due diligence process. And the M&A team will keep going back to you to, to uh, get your uh, unique take and unique expertise as we go through this process. <clears throat> so to dig in on the preliminary documentation, the, the non-disclosure agreement and the LOI, these are these are introductory documents that set the table between the two parties for the upcoming transaction. Um, the NDA will govern the information that's going to be exchanged between the parties as they go into the deal. Um, sometimes it might be simple if it's just a, a stock purchase and all information is confidential, but if it's an asset purchase and there's certain carve out uh, considerations that um, that it's a bigger company and you don't want to have information privy to the whole universe of that company's information, the NDA can be a little bit more uh, uh, specialized. And that it'll often include data room uh, information, what to do with those uh, documents and information, as well as any reports that come out of that uh, confidential information. So our due diligence report that we're going to discuss um, and any other type of derivative type information. Um, the LOI, the letter of intent, will include non-binding deal terms, which will include the purchase price. And as I mentioned before, that purchase price can go up or down depending on your due diligence findings. So that's, um, that's a, a way that your due diligence can directly impact the value of a transaction. So once you have an NDA sign and you've got an LOI agreed to, um, as Juan mentioned, that's probably when your M&A team lead is going to send out an email to all of the specialists that they're going to need support from on the transaction. Um, and, you know, that could be as few as, you know, four people. It could be as many as 20, you know, even more if you have a, a cross-border transaction that needs a lot of specific jurisdictional help as well. Uh, but as one mentioned, that mass email is really going to be where uh, you get a lot of your information about what's going on in the transaction and what your next steps are. Uh, but generally, once you get started, the first thing that specialists are going to need to comment on is a due diligence request list. We'll get into that more in a second. And then after a due diligence request list goes out and gets responded to, uh, the specialist will be released to go into uh, the electronic data room, or we commonly refer to it as a BDR, a virtual data room, uh, to start looking through documents and actually conducting the review or analyzing the information that's been provided. Um, and then you'll also conduct interviews with the the target management team, um, kind of rounding out your investigation, and then you'll put together your ultimate deliverable for the client, which is your due diligence report. And we'll talk about each of these things in turn. So why is due diligence important? So many reasons. <laughs> where, where do we begin? Uh, you know, due diligence is really an investigation into what we believe to be true about the target. Um, and I should mention that our approach here is really more from a buy side, although a lot of what we're talking about um, is transferable to a sell side. It's just your frame of mind is a little bit different when you're approaching um, sell side diligence or preparing schedules from a, a seller's perspective. So we're gonna continue to talk on the buy side, but just know that there, there are some slight differences, but um, generally a lot of this is applicable to both positions. 
Uh, but due diligence really confirms the value of the transaction. So if you're buying a target that has valuable IP, you want to make sure that that IP has been taken care of properly, that there's not, you know, any big third party claims out there that would drive down the value of the IP that, that you're acquiring. You want to make sure that your purchase price is correct, that there's no big ticket items that are coming down the line that are going to reduce the value of the company or the assets that you're buying. Um, and it's also going to drive a lot of the drafting too. A lot of what you find in due diligence is going to be reflected in the final purchase agreement as a closing deliverable, addressed in a covenant, addressed in the indemnification provision. Just depending on what comes up, there are a couple of different ways that those items can be reflected in the ultimate document. Um, and then you're also going to gather backup for the reps and warranties because, uh, you know, we'll talk a little bit later about the statements that the, the target company is going to make and then how they qualify those statements with disclosures uh, that are uh, an essential part of the transaction. And we could also uncover some regulatory issues as well, items that need to be addressed between signing and closing, um, whether that be making certain regulatory filings and waiting out waiting periods, um, tracking down third-party consents can also come up as well. So all of that's going to come out in our diligence process. And then if there's anything that's really material, <clears throat> that can't be addressed, um, you know, through a purchase price reduction, through an indemnification, or at some point between signing and closing, uh, that's going to be an, a commercial item for the business team to decide if it's even worthwhile to go forward with the transaction at that point. Um, and uh, I know I've definitely seen a transaction fall apart in diligence because issues have come up that the business parties weren't previously aware of uh, that have caused the buyer to walk away from the transaction. So uh, it's definitely, definitely important. Okay, so before a data room gets open, the buyer team is going to put together a due diligence request list. These can be fairly short, you know, 10 pages, maybe, maybe less. <laughs> pages, 10 pages yeah. is what we call short. Right. <laughs> I mean, they can be pretty in depth. You know, I've seen hundreds of pages in due diligence request lists before. Um, Excel spreadsheets with many, many tabs. Yes. Uh, also very common. Uh, but essentially, this is going to be where you tell the target what you want to know about them. What documents should they be uploading to the data room? What questions do you have for them? And this is the first place where subject matter experts are going to be able to provide some input. So you've gotten the LOI, you've gotten some information about the target, what's important to the client. Uh, the M&A team lead is going to say, hey, here's our draft request list. Do you have any comments? And you're going to take it and say, OK, and, you know, I'm making environmental comments. I'm going to look at the request for environmental and see, does this cover all of the questions I have for the company right now? Everything I might want to know about the company when it comes to environmental. Or um, if you're an employee benefits, does this cover all of the material items I want to know about the company with regard to employee benefits? Um, and not all of those items are going to be um, questions that the company responds to with a document in the data room. Some of them are going to be items that the company responds back with a narrative directly in your request list, just explaining the situation or saying yes or no. Um, a lot of times you're going to be asking some confirmatory questions that are just answered with a no, like, you know, have you bribed any foreign officials lately? Hopefully the answer to that is no. <laughs> um, but you will ask some of those questions that they seem, um, you know, almost perfunctory, but they're important because you want to be able to turn to your client at the end of the day and say, you know, we turned over every rock um, and we didn't uncover any issues. Yeah. And some practice areas don't lend themselves to, you know, data room documents. Yeah. So those confirmatory questions are, are some of the, you know, primary data gathering methods that, that we'll have to undertake. So conducting your due diligence. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have watched Partner Track on Netflix. 
I'm just going to plug this show right now. It is fantastically horrible. And <laughs> I, I think it's worth a watch. Um, there's not a lot of truth in it because what we do is not very exciting for TV shows. But at one point, the main character, she's an m a attorney and she goes to conduct some due diligence and she goes into her room full of boxes of physical paper. And she sits there and she's like, just conducting some due diligence, <laughs> like looking through all the paper, look at me, conduct due diligence. Um, no, <laughs> in reality, it's far more boring than that. It can't show us, you know, clicking through a data room. So yeah, that's but that's that's why it's called a virtual data room these days. Right. Um, yeah, it'd be pretty boring <laughs> to sit there and watch somebody scroll through a data room, <laughs> click on this document, <laughs> click on that document. Might uh, might do some OCR in there, you yeah, know, a little control F. <laughs> Wild in the search for <laughs> Right. <laughs> Um, but you will almost 100% be doing your due diligence uh, through a virtual data room. I have heard stories of, you know, transactions past where someone has done some physical diligence on site somewhere, but um, I definitely wouldn't say that's the norm. Yeah. Uh, but we've tried to lay out a couple of steps for you here on how you actually conduct due diligence. And our, our key words here are confirm, review, and report. Uh, when you're confirming things with your m and team lead, you really need to make sure you understand what they're expecting before you get started in your diligence. There's nothing worse than getting a report back from a specialist that doesn't conform to what you were expecting as the m and team lead, and then having to tell that specialist that you need them to go back and uh, redo or reformat whatever they've put together uh, with regard to the diligence, or you know, asking them if they looked into specific things and then having to go back and, and redo or at least tweak their analysis. Um, it's a time killer and it's it, it's frustrating for all parties. So, uh, you know, if you're ever in doubt, my biggest piece of advice to you is pick up the phone, call your M&A team lead um, and make sure that everybody's on the same page. And then uh, you're gonna do the actual review of the documents. And Juan's gonna go into some detail about that, what that looks like for the specific topic areas. And what are some of the things that you might run into? What are some of the documents you might see in the data room? What are some of the issues that commonly come up? And then you're gonna create your report out to the M&A team. Um, and I think that knowing your report format ahead of time is really helpful. So we're going to go through what the actual report out looks like before we go through the issues that, that you're going to see. Okay, so for the report, uh, these can take a couple different forms. Sometimes it'll be just one big memo with different sections broken out into environmental, IP, employee benefits, contracts review. Sometimes they're gonna be um, more of an Excel format, not my favorite personally. <laughs> um, and then other times uh, it'll be a, sort of a chart or a slide deck type format. Uh, but there's gonna be some common themes. One is that you're gonna have a high level summary of all the material documents you reviewed, sort of like a report out to the client of like, here are the different things that we looked at when conducting the review. Um, and then you'll also have a detailed summary that goes through the individual red flags that you found. Um, and whenever you do find an issue, it's gonna be important for you to identify the issue, quantify the risk, classify the risk, and then give some advice about how to cure or mitigate the issue. Um, so those are the big words that I'd like you to take away is identify, quantify, classify, and then advise. So what do I mean by um, classifying? I think identify is pretty self-explanatory. What is the issue? Quantify, um, if the issue can be quantified, it should be quantified. Because uh, if you come to me and you tell me, hey, you know, there's this material violation of this environmental law, my next question to you is going to be, great, how much does it cost, <laughs> right? Um, because that's what the business team is going to want to know too. How much does it cost? 
and and how do we fix it? Um, and then it's also going to be important to classify the issue. Is this a deal killer? Something that's a true red flag? It's a a high level risk item? Is it a medium level item? And things that I consider more medium level items are things that need to be addressed uh, pre-closing or in the purchase agreement somehow, but they're not issues that are going to materially, that should reduce the purchase price or, um, you know, could possibly alter the value proposition of the transaction. Um, and then low-level items are things that are easily addressed, common issues that can be fixed either pre- or post-closing. And then there's also some no-risk items that are just, hey, here's a report out of some material things. There's not a problem here. It's just a FYI, important things to be aware of. Um, we've given some examples here of what we consider to be high, medium, or low. Um, and that I think all of these are based on uh, experience, but you know we have seen before in a transaction that was real estate heavy, where um, an important facility for the target was actually built over a public road, like the actual building. Oh, yeah, oh, it, was, <laughs> it was it was not good. The actual building was built over a public road. I don't know <laughs> how this happened or why they had been operating that way, um, but that's that's a material item, um, and obviously something that the parties are going to need to figure out. You know, okay. Can we remediate this? Should we remediate this? Um, should we escrow some money for the issue? Should we get a line item indemnification? You know, those are that's a really big ticket item. Um, sort of medium level items. Any consents, I would say, are medium level. They're things that that you need to get before closing, but it's not a deal killer. Consents, everybody needs consents. You always need some consents. <laughs> um, <laughs> you don't want to overlook them and they should be, um, you know, coded in a medium level so that they get included into the purchase agreement, but uh, nobody's going to walk away from a transaction unless you can't get a material consent. Uh, know about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, at this point, uh, just being aware of the consent, it's a medium level. Um, and then sort of low level items, there's generally always some cleanup that needs to be done um, in the board resolutions or member consents. Uh, licenses, permits. Uh, licenses, permits. Um, you know, frequently we see some licenses that are up from renewal close in time to the transaction closing. Um, those are things that are going to happen. They're going to be renewed, but it's important that everybody's aware of them so that um, you know, they, they don't get lost in the transaction, but they're, they're not items that really have any risk associated. And then, of course, your no risk items, like just giving a general summary of, you know, material relationships and contracts. Um, or how long the lease is, termination, that kind of stuff. Just yeah. facts that we need to know. Yeah, exactly. Um, and just before we move on from here, um, if I haven't said it before, what's going to happen with this report is the M&A team lead is going to give it to the client and that it's going to drive discussions between us as M&A counsel and the client as to material items that we need to address in the purchase agreement and things we need to look further into and have further discussions about with the target. Um, and then Again, we're going to take those red items and those yellow items and put those directly into the purchase agreement. So <clears throat> we wanted to give a little bit more detail on the various specialist areas to say, you know, what are some items that you might, um, you know, be familiar with in your own practice, but how do they apply to the M&A context and how will we use them in our negotiation drafting uh, process and so on. Um, so these are kind of the high level areas that we're going to jump into um, quickly. Um, we don't, we're not going to go over tax or financial due diligence, but um, those are integral to every transaction. In fact, tax should really be involved kind of at the LOI stage, uh, pre pre getting into any any due diligence really, um, because that 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 is going to structure how the transaction is going to be uh, undertaken. So there's a lot of outcomes that are driven by tax that even even us as M and A counsel were like beholden to. Um, and then financial quality of earnings is usually undertaken by accountants, so we're, we're not too privy on that on the legal side. Uh, and thank goodness. <laughs> I'll run away from the numbers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, on the litigation lien side, 
Um, usually m and team, paralegals, uh, somebody will run lien searches. And that's looking for UCC uh, lien, security interest, bankruptcy, uh, litigation, anything like that that is ongoing, pending, or completed that the company um, is subject to. And these are done at the state level, usually at the state where the company is organized or formed. Um, and then sometimes if that's different from where the principal place of operations are, um, they'll look at judgments in, in the you know, operating uh, areas and headquarters. Um, the overarching theme that you're going to see, not just in the litigation lean space, but across all of these areas is, are there actual or potential liabilities that will materialize or could materialize that we need to account for in, in the deal documents. Um, that's kind of the main theme behind all of these issue areas. Um, so on the, on the lien side, if there's a credit agreement, a loan document, any sort of, of, of financing that includes uh, you know, restrictions, covenants, um, or security interests that we need to account for that either need to be released at closing, so there's you know, a release agreement, um, if they need to be paid term, uh, and terminated, so forth, we need to be aware of that. And we're not you know, in a position to go into the loan documents and, and right away come out with that type of information. So we're gonna look to our finance colleagues to, to go through that and give us you know, their, their advice regarding the same. Um, anything else? Yeah, no. Uh, and then the same thing for uh, any litigation risks as well. Uh, you know, sometimes you get court filings that are just put into the data room. Uh, you know, I can read a court filing and go, <laughs> right, read a court filing, right? Um, yeah. But we're really going to look to our litigation team to advise us on what's going on, what the risk is, um, and then give us a, you know, the quantification and classification and then the advice yeah. on what to do next. <laughs> Even if it's not a court filing, you might see emails between the client and, you know, whoever that might, incident might have happened to between client and its own general counsel. Mm -hmm. That kind of lends to, hey, this might be a threatened or potential uh, claim. So that's something that we need to be aware of, especially if you think that as, as you review the database or the, the data room, that it's something that's a systemic issue that mm -hmm. is more than just a one-time course of business claim. That's something that, that we need to be aware of as a buyer kind of going through uh, the, the, the process. Yeah. And, you know, I've seen it before where uh, in response to a DD request list, uh, the target gives sort of an explanation of something that's occurred that's not in litigation yet, but that uh, could easily give rise to litigation. Uh, and then it's really important to have your litigation specialist back you up and say, well, here's my own take on the company's exposure here so that we can come into the negotiation. Well, we've done our own analysis of this situation and here's what we think the risk is so that we can, um, you know, then have a more effective negotiation about the issue. Right. Okay. On the IP side, um, IP is, is, the threshold question on IP is, you know, what kind of target is this? There are targets that IP is not very material and there are targets that the IP is the entire value proposition. So once you get past that, once you once you answer that question about how material is the IP um, to this company, we're going to look at what kind of IP are there. Is it registered? Is it unregistered? Is it patents? Is it trademarks? Is it you know their domain name or is it a specific kind of a trade secret type process? And how you um, as as the IP specialist would recommend either protecting or following up on 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 this IP situation. Um, most common issue that we see on, 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 on the deal side of, on, regarding IP is, has the IP been properly documented and has it been properly assigned? Um, a lot of times, smaller companies, especially if, if the IP is material and they're developing kind of an in-house database or an in-house product, um, they might not have signed proper employee invention assignment agreements so that the IP is clearly owned by the company. And that's something that, that we need the IP specialist to flag and if necessary, get those uh, proper agreements in place pre-closing or as a closing deliverable. Um, anything else on this one? No, I, I think that's great. Yeah, I, I personally have seen a lot of the, the mom and pop shops need to do some cleanup on their IP assignments. Yep. Um, on the employee benefit side for, for our employee benefit specialists, 
This includes um, both the employment, um, sorry, employment matters and employee benefits matters. So um, stuff like the employee census and then also their employee incentive benefit plans, ERISA matters. Um, so from the census, we're going to look at what jurisdictions does the uh, target employ and uh, their people, you know, are there are these jurisdictions that have common issues such as like Massachusetts and California that are a little bit more regulated and and have more uh, more items to keep track of that need to have been uh, taken care of or that we need to, uh, you know, either remedy or, or address via indemnification um, in, in agreements. Um, on the employment side, looking at the census, you know, have the employees been properly classified and are there any wage and hour concerns? Um, these are typically the, the biggest issues or the most common issues that we run into yeah. um, in, in our M&A processes is that oftentimes there might be one or two employees that are hourly and might not be classified properly, but sometimes there's a whole you know, office that that's the case and there, there's a million dollar exposure there. So we need to kind of address that materiality and see what, what, we, what we can do to work around that to get to a deal. Um, another point that comes up now frequently after COVID is mass layoffs. If there are any RIFs, reductions in workforce, um, is there any uh, WARN Act implications? Um, and this is where we would look to you because we know of the WARN Act, but we don't know what it means that well. So we need to look to you know, our employment people to say, okay, this is an issue that we need to work around, or this is okay. I think that this is not going to be material for the deal. Yeah, uh, one of the other big things that comes up in employee benefits, or I should say common, because it's not really an issue, but it is something that we flag for um, for diligence purposes is severance payments mm -hmm. for change of control. That's fairly common. Um, and uh, we would also want to report out of any management incentive plans and how those would be impacted by a change of control as well, because, you know, there's typically some acceleration, um, you know, there might be some holdbacks of management incentive that would be good to know about uh, to encourage management to stay on, things like that. Um, so those are all issues that employee benefits would look out for and then sometimes even stuff that isn't an issue like a review of the general benefits policy is helpful for your client because they're going to be planning their post-closing integration so it's helpful for them to be aware of what hr policies are in place so that they can start to plan on how they're going to merge those per persons into the new HR policies if there's material differences. You know, sometimes uh, some of the smaller shops have been paying out their Christmas bonuses by, <laughs> you know, here's a bag of cash, right? So um, knowing those issues too uh, can be helpful for, for the client to be able to be aware of when they're planning their integration. Right. <clears throat> on the environmental side, this one is similar to IP in that, you know, in some deals, it might not be an issue, but in some deals, if it's a manufacturing or some kind of a, you know, chemical process, um, it's going to be a very material, very uh, salient issue that we need to deal with. Um, this this envi environmental um, review is going to be primarily done through a uh, questionnaire. There may be a couple of reports in the data room, but uh, primarily, it's going to be through the asking, you know, back and forth and follow up question process through that through the questionnaires, and um, it's mainly going to result if there's in you know owned owned real estate um, doesn't come up so much in the lease real estate context, um, but if the client owns the real estate and they're you know subject to liability for for what's in the ground um, or what they've done operationally on on the site is it, this will uh, you know be an issue. Um, and mainly the review is, you know, ha have there been any issues? Have there, is there, have there been any reports that have been come out of those uh, possible issues? Have there been, you know, such as phase ones or, or even phase twos? Oftentimes those will be available in the data room, data room, but sometimes you might have to request those separately if you've noticed that there is a possibility for there to be, have been an issue. Um, and then if necessary, we're going to look to you to say, hey, we should, you know, get a, an environmental consultant to take a closer look if it has not already been engaged. Um, environmental feeds into real estate. Um, again, you know, we're going to look to our real estate specialist to say, to look at the lease agreements um, or, or the deeds um, if it, in case that the property is owned and make sure that everything was properly and validly documented. This is an area where, you know, it's very uh, document focused on, on proper uh, documentation. 
Um, and then also on the just in the terms of, in the in perspective of a transaction, are there or there are there usually are, but what kind of change of control or change of assignment or um, consents or notices requirements are there under the real estate documentation? Um, is this something that the seller needs to do pre-closing or is the seller uh, and the buyer going to go and renegotiate the lease together um, going come to, to emerge out of this closing so that the buyer knows what terms they're getting into for, you know, 5, 10, 15 years? Um, and, and another another point to look at in these contracts is what kind of restrictions exist on the use of the property. You know, being familiar with the buyer's um, goals and per and plan purpose of the for the property will help them again going to that post closing integration to say, okay, well this is something that we can do, or we can't bring this type of process onto this mesh onto the site, or maybe is this something that we even want to do follow up with this deal or is this a deal killer that we can't actually do what we want to do at this uh at this uh real estate premise yeah you know um i, I don't know how far you've watched into partner track <laughs> but uh, there's a point when she's doing this you know document diligence that she's looking at a lease and there's i don't remember some issue with the lease um but you know, she goes in and investigates this lease. Um, I'd be picking up the phone to call my real estate specialist and saying, hey, did you review this lease? What's going on, right? Um, mm -hmm. And really looking to my real estate <laughs> specialist for that as opposed to trying to solve some lease issues myself. Definitely. All right, compliance. This one is a, this area is another one that is going to be mainly undertaken through questionnaire. This is one that when we're going thinking about the confirmatory review, like Caitlin said, you know, have you bribed a foreign official? <laughs> have you, you know, have you received sanctions? Are you working? Do you have any operations in a sanctioned country? That's something that, you know, may be visible through I don't know, some financial records, operations, you know, contracts. But more often than not, it's going to be a, you know, yes or no question in, in, the, in the diligence questionnaire. Um, and then looking at the VDR, the policies that are in place, making sure they're sufficient, you know, depending on the sophistication of the target, it, they might be, sometimes they might not be. Mm -hmm. But again, that's what we're going to look to you to say this is, you know, this is something that is uh, warranted or sufficient for the level or the activity that the client is, or that the target is undertaking, or this is, you know, lacking. And this is some area in an area that we need to be concerned with. Um, either pre-closing that there's already an issue or post-closing integration wise that we need to step up their policies and get something in place um, right away so that we're we're improving that. Um, I think that's it for that one. Yeah. Great. So uh, we've obviously not gone into depth on every single issue that can be covered in diligence. So much of what you're looking at is going to be driven by the needs of the parties, uh, what the target is involved in, and you know what the buyer is concerned about. These are just examples of some of the other areas that we commonly engage subject matter experts for. Data privacy and cybersecurity, hot topics, um, especially if the target is handling personally identifiable information. Um, we've worked on several transactions recently where a target has had a data breach of some sort. Um, and so you will spend a lot of time talking to your data security and cybersecurity subject matter experts about um, about how to handle those breaches, nope. uh, how how you're going to cover off that risk in the purchase agreement, um, and and how you're going to address it on a go forward basis. Uh, and and if there's certain you know notification obligations oh, under state law, uh, yeah. any penalties, making sure that all of all of those issues are buttoned up. Yeah, and it, and again. The, even though we're generally familiar with those issues, those are things that we really lean on our subject matter experts for to tell us, you know, exactly what notice periods, what notices should have gone out and when, and, um, you know, what the, the fines are for the different breaches and stuff like that. Um, again, we're aware that they exist, but, but um, we're certainly not experts on the topic, so we definitely need some guidance. Um, and the same thing with customs, trade, immigration, um, you know, any of these really specific areas. I wouldn't say that we get into insurance too much. Um, most of the time that can be handled by the buyer in-house. They really know what type of insurance policies they're looking at. But um, every once in a while, we get asked some <laughs> insurance questions. It's true. Okay, so... Uh, after diligence is complete, um, 
and really this comes up more in the in between signing and closing period um there might be some lag time where stuff isn't really happening um and what's going to happen during that time is it's probably an hsr waiting period or um you know we're making CFIUS filings uh, things of that nature and I, you can also have just a, an interim period where you're going to go address a lot of those red and medium items as well um, and go track down your consents, talk to your material customers, things like that. Um, we're not really going to go into antitrust and um, in CFIUS regulations. We just kind of included this information as an FYI. It's an area where we, again, lean on subject matter experts. Okay, so You've done your diligence review. You've had, um, you know, a couple of request lists go back and forth. You've done your interviews with management. All of your questions are answered. Uh, what next? What do you do next? The report has gone out to the client. Well, while all of that is happening, the M&A team is going to be putting together the purchase agreement. Um, and it, maybe at the same time or after diligence is completed, in an ideal world, all of diligence would be completed and then you would negotiate your purchase agreement. Um, unfortunately, we don't live in an ideal world, so that doesn't always happen. A lot of times negotiating the purchase agreement is going on while diligence continues to go on. but uh, Negotiating the purchase agreement is actually another big place where specialists get involved, um, and particularly in the reps and warranties section. Uh, and your reps and warranties, depending on the size of the transaction, they can be just, yeah. <laughs> they can be a beast sometimes. They can be very, very long. Um, and each individual topic can, like I've seen environmental reps that are, you know, pages long. Employment, Employment reps can be several pages long. If you have material IP, several pages just about IP. Um, and the reps and warranties from the company, their statements from the company about their business. Uh, and they're really important because it's going to delineate um, what claims we the buyer could make post-closing if uh, some, an issue comes up in the post-closing period. So the, from the target perspective, they want to make sure that they are making accurate statements and that they are disclosing any information that would make a statement inaccurate so that they aren't on the hook for making for any losses caused by inaccurate statements in the reps and warranties, because this is what the company is again relying on for the value of the transaction. So, you know, if the company says, I own all of my IP and there's no outstanding third party claims, and then in the post closing period, um, it turns out that they didn't own all of their IP prior to closing. Um, and there are out, there were outstanding third party claims prior to closing. Um, any losses that are suffered by the company during that post closing period because of that issue would be indemnifiable. Presumably, you can negotiate. <laughs> you can negotiate all kinds of different things, but uh, presumably, the buyer would be able to um, claim those losses against the company because of their inaccurate statements. Um, and the reps and warranties, they are going to cover every area that your due diligence covers. Um, and you as a specialist, you're going to be sent a copy of the purchase agreement and your m and team lead is going to say, hey, um, you know, here's our approach to this transaction, be it, you know, extremely buyer friendly, aggressive, more middle of the road, um, you know, live with it if you can, whatever the approach is going to be and say, I'd like you to go comment on the reps and warranties. And so what that looks like practically is you as a junior associate will work with someone more senior in your group. Um, and the two of you will sit down, review the particular rep and warranty that applies to your area um, and make comments that are informed by what you know about the target through the diligence process. And then the other important area where your diligence is going to be used is in the disclosure schedules. If you're on the sell side, you're going to be helping the company prepare these schedules and make sure that they are disclosing um, anything that's an affirmative disclosure, anything where the rep and warranty says listed on Schedule X is Y. Uh, you'll be helping them fill that out and making sure that Y is on that schedule. And also exceptions to the rep and warranty where um, you, know, you have a statement made by the company 
but you need to list something that qualifies that statement such that the two can be read together so, so that the statement is true, so that you can read the rep and warranty. It may say, you know, um, my name is Juan Velasquez <laughs> and, and he would need to disclose my full legal name is Juan Philippe Velasquez. <laughs> um, and you would have to read those two in connection to get the full statement of the company. Um, but it's important that uh, specialists are reviewing those schedules, especially on the buy side, because you want to pick up the schedule and compare it to your diligence notes or your diligence report and make sure that everything on the schedule matches what you know through diligence um, so that you know, we're all on the same page and we're all in agreement that the information on the schedules is correct. So here are some examples of some reps and warranties and, um, and some disclosures. Uh, given the amount of time we have, I'm not going to go into detail on these, but, um, you know, encourage you to read through them later. They're just some fun examples of some affirmative disclosures, um, an exception disclosure, and then uh, the third one is actually a disclosure that doesn't call for um, a schedule, but nonetheless has a statement that needs to be made by the company. And just a note on schedules, whenever you're reviewing schedules as a specialist, uh, discretion can be encouraged for sensitive topics because uh, your schedules can be discoverable. So if uh, you're sell side or buy side, you just wanna make sure that uh, you're working closely with the M&A team to not over disclose information. So after you get um, your per your agreements, your purchase agreement, all your ancillaries uh, signed and you're getting looking towards post-closing integration, this is still going to be informed by uh, the due diligence process. We just kind of wanted to make a note of this because this is something that, um, you know, as bullet point number two says here, this should be considered at the beginning of the transaction, not after closing, and that the diligence findings that our specialists come up with are going to be used by the buyer and you know the report that you generate is going to be used by the buyer to take over the company and be sure to successfully integrate it and get the full value of it following closing so you know this is the one step further that the specialist can identify that will help you know on the business side it's going to help uh, uh, immensely um, so that the buyer can seamlessly step in and say, okay, here are the things that we need to do. Here are the tasks, here are the items, here are the filings um, that we need to do or have in mind in order to take over this business and start making money, uh, you know, maybe day one. Um, so that so that involves, you know, what kind of, uh, you know, tax filings? Is there anything that, actually, we have a slide for this. <laughs> Integration items by a practice area and stuff for tax. Are there any, you know, desirable filings or conversions, anything that needs to be taken on that side? On the labor and employment side, is there, uh, are there any employees that we need to move from one entity to another so that they're properly integrated into a business uh, division or group? Um, employment agreements that need to be amended or, or refined based on, on the, new, uh, the new company uh, policies, um, payroll, wage practices, so forth. Benefits, Caitlin mentioned earlier, making sure that the benefit plans are transitioned over and they mesh and the, and the employees are properly taken care of. Um, and then compliance, local training of the new employees. Sometimes there are cultural differences, especially mm -hmm. in multi-jurisdictional deals. Just making sure that everybody gets up to speed. You know, if it's a public company buying a non-public company, the, the compliance and, and some of the uh, regulation on the non-public company is going to be uh, needs to be stepped up. And that's something that the client ahead of time is they're going to value knowing what needs to happen. And that's all going to come from that diligence review and, and, and kind of the start of the transaction. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So uh, we hope that gave you a good overview of you know, what your role as a non-M&A attorney is in an M&A transaction. And um, hopefully, you know, next time you get that all hands email saying, hey guys, <laughs> uh, congratulations, you've been staffed on this transaction. Um, hopefully you're a little more comfortable with what you're being asked to do and some of the terms that are being used. Um, we have just a couple minutes if there's any questions. Um, and if not, um, we hope you'll refer back to these slides and reach out to us later if you come up with any questions. Absolutely. Um, Harriet, I, I don't know if uh, take over. 
no, I don't think I have any questions, but I'm just going to let everyone um, type in the chat box or the Q&A if they do. Perfect. Um, and just if anyone has missed any part of this fantastic presentation, um, please uh, do note that this will be uh, this has been recorded and will be posted on uh, Hila's YouTube channel um, for further reference. You too. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Well, Harriet, if there's no questions, um, I think we're going to sign off, but uh, we really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, oh, sorry, someone was asking a, a question oh. that's for us. Um, a copy of the slides. Um, um, is that something that you we can discuss we'll, offline? <laughs> yeah, we'll, we'll send them to, to Harriet and the Hila team and uh, they'll take care of distribution, I'm sure. Great, thank you. I'm um, sorry, I think we just had one other question. Oh, no, just someone saying thank you so much. Um, thank you, Caitlin yep. and Juan, that was fantastic. We really enjoyed having you. Um, and thank you so much, everyone, for joining. Please remember to self-report your credit. The CLE number is in the chat. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.